today, this press briefing is a curtain raiser for the 2021 ECOSOC Financing for Development Forum, which opens next week on Monday and runs till the 15th. A year after the declaration of the pandemic, while some economies look set to make a comeback this year, for many developing countries, with the pandemic still raging and poverty deepening, the United Nations has warned of the risk of a sharply diverging world and says the world must act decisively and with speed to prevent another lost decade for development. How do we ensure this doesn't happen? Here to provide his perspective is President of the United Nations Economic and Social Council, or ECOSOC, His Excellency Ambassador Munir Akram. Ambassador Akram is the 76th President of ECOSOC and the current Permanent Representative of Pakistan to the United Nations. Without further ado, Ambassador Akram, the floor is yours. I thank you very much, uh, Francine, and, uh, and thank you for this opportunity. Uh, and I apologize for the technical problems which uh, delayed this, uh, this briefing. Um, uh, the Economic and Social Council has been uh, engaged for at least a year now with the COVID crisis. Uh, our response now would need to cover the following points, and I think I, I should go directly with, to what I see would be the actions. Firstly, we need to respond to the, the pandemic. Vaccine uh, production and distribution is critical at the moment. Uh, there are constraints on production, uh, and these are constraints that have been uh, put by uh, intellectual property uh, restrictions, as well as capacity restrictions in, in production, because I think insufficient anticipation that several vaccines would be produced and could be, uh, and could be available. Secondly, we need to avoid uh, vaccine nationalism, uh, both in the production as well as in the distribution of vaccines. Uh, the, the, the incidences of export restrictions on vaccines is, is deplorable. Uh, and I believe that we also need to fully finance the COVAX and the Act 1 uh, accelerator. Uh, there is a, still a gap of about $16 billion, as I understand it, in financing the COVAX facility, which is which will distribute, which was meant to buy vaccines and distribute these to at least 20% of the priority populations in all countries. Uh, and this is far behind schedule. And the vaccine inequality is now becoming more and more visible. Uh, vaccine inequality will translate into inequality in the impact of the pandemic, both economic and social. And this will be act as an eroder of international solidarity. So we need to have quick action on the response to the pandemic and, and to contain the virus equitably and globally. Secondly, uh, we need to mobilize the financing for recovery from the COVID pandemic. Uh, the Economic and Social Council's Financing for Development Forum will meet on the 12th of April uh, in a high-level segment meeting with heads of state uh, and, and heads of government as well as ministers. And it is my hope that they, we will come out with some positive developments at, at this at this session. Firstly, I'm encouraged by the fact that there is an agreement at the G20 level uh, for the creation of $650 billion in new SDRs. There is also a likely proposals, proposal from the managing director of the IMF to the IMF board for the repurposing or reallocation 
of unutilized SDRs of some countries to provide assistance to developing countries. I hope that this reallocation will be sizable and that it will be applied to those countries which actually need the liquidity and fiscal space at the moment. Thirdly, the uh, debt suspension initiative of the Group of 20 uh, uh, has been agreed to be extended until December of 2021. Uh, it is, of course, uh, said it will be the last extension, uh, but we sh I hope that the G20 will remain flexible uh, with regard to the timing, because we are not very really sure how far and how long the pandemic will last, especially in the developing there is also a demand from the developing countries to double the replenishment of the uh, IDA uh, and from 30 billion to 60 billion. Uh, I hope that this will find a positive response. There are some negative aspects uh, to our efforts on financing. Um, the private sector creditors have not so far participated in the debt suspension. And we need to find ways in which to secure their participation, because for many countries, uh, the private uh, debt is the largest part of the debt, and we need to see how we can, we can cover that. Secondly, the DSSI uh, has not been extended to certain middle-income countries, which are in also in a very vulnerable situation, especially some of the small island developing countries. Uh, and this needs to be reviewed. Thirdly, the level of official development assistance has declined from, from donor countries uh, during the last year. And it is difficult to see how this will be reversed. So the FFT forum will focus on these financing issues, and I hope that we will be able to adopt some clear-cut decisions for action. There is also, of course, a discussion that is underway within uh, this context on climate action, because the Secretary General has stated that we, in order to, in recovering from the COVID crisis, we should recover better, we should uh, build back better, and this is an opportunity for the world to transform the fossil fuel economy into a green economy. Um, of course, uh, this is an important uh, objective, but it will only be achieved if the developed country partners are able to fulfill their commitments under the Paris Agreements, fulfill the commitments on, on carbon emission reductions, uh, fulfill their commitment in particular with regard to the to the mobilization of $100 billion in uh, climate finance, uh, especially climate finance for adaptation by developing countries, uh, which does not seem to be in sight. Uh, and thirdly, the application in the whole transformation process and the climate change uh, process or the application of the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities between the advanced and the developing countries, between the small and the large countries, between the small emitters and the large emitters. Uh, this CBR, CBDR principle needs to be applied universally uh, and fully. Uh, we have also, of course, to understand that recovery from COVID will remain fragile and will remain temporary unless we utilize this opportunity to also introduce structural reforms in the, at the national and international level in uh, the international financial system, in the debt architecture, in the trade regime, uh, and in the tax regime, uh, and these structural changes are important for the sustainability and the resilience of the recovery that we hope to finance on an emergency basis. Um, we are also seeking to promote investment in 
uh, sustainable infrastructure because the entire structure of, of entire transformation from a fossil fuel economy to a green economy will basically be constituted in the transformation of in infrastructure, the energy, energy infrastructure, transportation, communications, all of this which undergirds the economies and undergirds the production and consumption patterns in economies, agriculture, industry, manufacturing, all of that is affected by the nature of infrastructure. And it is important to mobilize uh, an investment in infrastructure. There is at least $1.5 trillion necessary to be invested each year in developing countries. The level is a minute fraction of this amount. Um, we need to tap both public money as well as private, private sector money. There's $378 trillion earning no interest rates or low interest rates sitting with asset managers. This money needs to be redirected, redeployed, and invested in the promotion of uh, sustainable infrastructure in order to create a green economy and a more equitable world. So I will stop there and I welcome any questions. Thank you, Francine. Thank you, Ambassador. Let me now open the floor to questions. Um, if I can ask if you put your name and media outlet in the chat um, box, and I'll call on you. But let me first start with the president of the UN Correspondents Association. Cool. Valerie, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, and thank you, Ambassador, for uh, uh, for this press uh, press briefing. Uh, so my question uh, uh, is this: uh, In Europe, uh, the vaccine AstraZeneca uh, is now suggested to be used for people uh, above uh, uh, over 55 or over 60 years old. Uh, so, uh, looking uh, at countries with uh, a very young uh, population age, so a very average young population age, um, is this will be a problem on the distribution, a further problem on the distribution, or do you already have an alternative or a plan B? Thank you so much. Very much. Um... Yes, we, we've heard of the problems with AstraZeneca, and I believe that some restrictions have been placed by some of the European countries on the use of AstraZeneca. Um, uh, and, of course, uh, I just saw a news article about uh, South Africa have, uh, has also rejected the uh, import of AstraZeneca. I haven't confirmed that, uh, that information. Um, so I think people... Obviously, there's a, going to be a perception issue uh, with regard to AstraZeneca. Um, but the, the, the good news is that um, the trials and utilization of other vaccine, the Sputnik V Russian vaccine, uh, the two Chinese uh, vaccines, these seem to have had a perfectly good record and perfectly good results wherever they've been used. And in several developing countries, some of these vaccines are being used. In Pakistan, for example, they've been used. So uh, I think what we need to do is to ramp up production uh, from all sources. Uh, and to um, uh, I think for, for this to happen, you need to waive the, the intellectual property uh, restrictions or at least to share the technologies of production uh, with a larger number of countries, because even even developing countries like my own, uh, we have we can produce things, uh, but we just don't have the the the, uh, the the rights to do so or the technology to do so. So I think in developing countries, uh, a we've been focused on distribution through COVAX, and that's going slow because the money is not there because the vaccine supply is not there. So while we are doing that distributive effort, we also need in parallel to expand production in as many countries as possible. And I think that's the only way we will get even close to getting developing countries vaccinated uh, in the near future. Thank you, Ambassador. 
Um, we have three questions from the floor. In the interest of time, I'm going to ask each one to pose the question, and then if you could take all three questions, if that's okay. Um, so we'll start with um, Ibtisam Azam from Al Arabi newspaper. Um, I'll then pass the floor to Abdel Hamid Siam of Akuda Al Arabia, Al Arabia, and then Ifkta Ali from AP Pakistan. Um, Ibtisam, if you could take your question, and then um, and then we'll roll with the other two colleagues as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Francie. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, I have uh, first a follow-up on the issue of uh, vaccine uh, production and the intellectual uh, property issue. Um, if you could, I mean, we see that even on a UN level, uh, we, when the Secretary General asked about the issue of lifting the intellectual property, uh, uh, property uh, he is reluctant to call for that and speaking to the issue with the COVAX. So my question is, uh, or my follow-up is, uh, how do you want to reach uh, this, um, uh, the, the issue of uh, capacity production and um, how do you, which reactions you are getting when you are talking to, um, to companies uh, on this issue? And my, my other question is on the private sector issue and the um, uh, creditor uh, role that you talked about. Uh, and if you could go a little bit uh, deeper into this issue and which role you think governments could play uh, in putting pressure on the private sector uh, um, to um, be more um, helpful uh, when it comes to uh, debt. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, at some, uh, uh, well, On the vaccine production, um, I think there are several issues where, where we need greater clarity and greater action. Uh, with regard to the intellectual property, property rights waiver, this is, uh, this is, of course, being discussed in the, in the WTO. We need, we need to exert political pressure at, at a high level to secure the agreement of the countries and companies concerned to at least do a temporary suspension of the, of the patent rights and, and, and allow the production, or at least to transfer the technology for production, uh, even if they do not suspend or, or, or waive the IP rights. I think there are various ways to do this, and we need to find a way uh, that is agreeable to all concerned. Uh, but above all, I think it's a, it's a political issue uh, at this time. Uh, during the AIDS crisis, we did get a suspension on IP bites uh, in the WTO. Uh, we have failed to do so at this time in the WTO. There has been a proposal sponsored by a very large number of developing countries, which has not been accepted. Uh, and therefore, we need to mobilize political opinion behind this demand and to find some way, whether it's waiver, suspension, transfer of technology, the, all, all modalities, any modality that would enable a broader production of the vaccine, especially in developing countries. Uh, I think we should, we should explore that. Uh, we are going to have a an event, the Microsoft will have a special event on the 16th of April on, on the whole issue of vaccine. Uh, we call it a uh, vaccine for all uh, event. And I hope uh, that we will be able to mobilize opinion in favor of some uh, greater equity in both in vaccine distribution as well as in vaccine production, because we need both of them. If if we are going to get anywhere close to being able to vaccinate uh, a proportion of the of the populations in, the, in developing countries, so uh, that's with regard to vaccine. On on the debt, um, I, I understand you were referring to private sector participation on the debt issue. Uh, uh, if I, if I understood you, uh, on the debt issue, 
Um, of course, so far, all the efforts have been to promote a voluntary participation of the, of the private sector. Um, it, is, it is possible that if we can get a, a ceasefire agreement with the rating agency, uh, that if the private sector creditor uh, it was to provide debt suspension uh, to any of its debtors, that this would not result in a down, downgrade of, of, the, of the debt itself. Uh, because the, you know, in such situations, the debt will become highly discounted, and that's what the private creditor wishes to avoid. Uh, and if we can find ways to work with the rating agencies in order to ensure against the um, <clears throat> discounting of debt, that would be one way. The second way would be for national governments to adopt um, legislation uh, which would ensure against um, a negative impact on the debt itself. Uh, and uh, prevent hold-out creditors from profiting from whatever discounts happen uh, with regard to, to the debt that is suspended. Uh, you know the whole story about Argentina uh, and about the vulture, vulture funds. Uh, we have to avoid that. And most of the private creditors say that they are afraid of providing the suspension because then they would be holdouts and they would lose money while the holdout, holdouts would make money uh, through, through this so-called vulture fund um, modality. So we have to find legislative ways, either at the national level or international level, some legislative way of, of ensuring that that doesn't happen, that vulture funds are not able to take advantage of the situation. Um, some people even have talked about the Security Council resolution under Chapter 7 to do so, but that's, a, that's what I would call a nuclear option uh, in this situation. Thank you, Ambassador. Um, in the interest of, of time, I'm cognizant that we maybe have five minutes left. Can I ask that um, Al Abdel Hamid come in with his question? If Tika, if you can come in straight behind him. And also, I see a question um, for a request from Nigeria. If um, Akinyami, if you can put that in the chat, then I can relay that quicker to the ambassador also. So, Abdel Hamid, and then Iftikhar, if you can come in. Thank you. Thank you, Prince. Thank you, Ambassador. Also, um, the presidency is coming almost to an end soon. I don't know exactly when, but. Uh, I expect it soon. So you consumed most of your presidency during this pandemic. My question, Mr. Ambassador, uh, what, in your opinion, what are those long-term impact that this pandemic has left on international community? And what lessons you can pass to international community uh, to learn from this pandemic and how vulnerable it proved that most of the national security is vulnerable as they pay more attention sometimes to weapons and arms rather than health security. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mo. Thank you. And if, sorry, if, if Tika, if you can um, pose your question um, and then the ambassador can respond to both. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Ambassador, for doing this briefing. Uh, you also spoke about uh, sustainable uh, the need for sustainable infrastructure. In this connection, I would like to ask you, what has been the progress on your proposal to create a facility under UN's umbrella for infrastructure investment in developing countries? Thank you, sir. Um, thank you. Um, uh, let me uh, let me respond to the two questions, uh, both very um, very important. Uh, with regard to the long term impact of this crisis, I think first of all, what we have learned is that the global 
community was completely unprepared to deal with the pandemic uh, of this nature. Despite the fact that the WHO and others have been warning for several years about the possibility of such a pandemic. And they have now again warned that this may not be the last pandemic, there could be others in the future. So we need, obviously, to strengthen our health systems and our ability to communicate uh, and to cooperate in order to control such viruses at the inception and not at the tail end. So I think that's the first thing. Second thing, as I see, is we have seen the inequality between countries and between peoples within countries. The poor, both in the rich countries and the poorest in the poorest countries, have suffered the most. And this is a, a vivid illustration of the nature of our international system and national structures where there is no equity. Inequality has, uh, you know, 100 million people have been pushed into poverty during this crisis. At the same time, the richest people have added $337 billion to their wealth, the richest 10%. So I think there are so many, um, so many illustrations from this crisis of the inequality in structures. And I think if we are going to build back better, as the Secretary General has said, we must address not only the climate crisis, but we have to address the crisis of inequality because we cannot build back better if we continue on this path of inequality. So those are the two. A major lessons, of course, there are many lessons uh, to be learned here, uh, and we will draw those lessons for the future. But those are two large lessons um, that uh, at least uh, I see. On the on if the hard question about sustainable infrastructure, um, we have uh, I have put that proposal forward. Uh, I think there is a vital need to mobilize both public and especially private money for sustainable and for investment in sustainable infrastructure. Uh, we are getting um, a fraction of the money. Uh, there, there is a gap of at least a trillion dollars each year in, in, uh, in investment in sustainable infrastructure. I believe we have to find uh, two things. One, we have to find a way of connecting the private money, the private sector resources, to projects in developing countries. And secondly, we need to develop good projects in developing countries. We, they do not have the capacity to develop such projects. And I, th I believe that the UN system can be helpful in developing, in, in assisting on both sides of this equation, in accessing the finance and also in developing a pipeline of projects. Um, We've had two informal discussions. Uh, I have scheduled another uh, discussion, in this, this time with the private sector, with pension funds, private equity funds, uh, and other, uh, others in the private sector to try and elicit exactly what it would take for them to invest in sustainable infrastructure. And I think as a result of these, uh, these processes, I hope that we will be able to reach uh, some agreement or conclusion on the creating a mechanism of facility to enable the United Nations to help uh, in promoting sustainable investment, uh, sustainable infrastructure investment. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. We have one last question, which comes from Akin, Akin Yemi in Nigeria. Um, so far, only the African continent does not have active production of a COVID-19 vaccine. Does the UN have any program to help Africa overcome this lag? Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, I, I think uh, that there are the vast majority of developing countries do not have 
the capacity to produce the vaccine. Uh, so for many countries, you know, including uh, Pakistan, for example, uh, we, will, we will need to actually repurpose existing production facilities for other pharmaceuticals in order to produce these vaccines. And I, I think that the repurposing of pharmaceutical uh, uh, factories, uh, factories producing, you know, various other kinds of, uh, of medicines, they can be repurposed very quickly if the technology is transferred to enable them to do so. If they get some technical assistance to be able to repurpose those factories, they can do so. Uh, so I believe in, in on the African continent, even, even if there are no production facilities at the present time, but a country like Nigeria, South Africa, Kenya, all of these countries can very quickly uh, switch uh, their existing production of other, other medicines and, uh, in order to produce uh, the vaccine if they get the technology. Uh, and that's what we are pressing for. We are pressing for distribution, equitable distribution, we're pressing for equity for wider production and scaled up manufacturing of the vaccine. And I think we have to push at both ends uh, to get it done. Thank you so much, Ambassador. We we're just closing perfectly on the hour. So let me thank you for today's informative briefing and thank everyone for joining um, and wishing everyone um, to stay safe and stay well and um, a good weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.